Medina, who Medina speaks as she reads. Research Strategies, 5th edition. And I'm picking up where I left off now, because I'm pissed off. And I gotta kinda decompress, because it, you know, it's always gonna be haters in the world, but when you get starting off a page that I started typing yesterday and nearly was like up to where I was up to the diagnoses and the treatments of this chapter, um, long story short, I went back and had to review, which only helps me, but it, it made me tired. Um, it got bumped back from like from the P's to the L's in alphabetical order, you know, that if somebody bumps you from, you made it all the way down to the, the L M N O P. You're you're far from the L that you what you was yesterday. So because that took an hour and a half, why it takes so long is that here's the culprit. Okay, and these terms here are very important to keep con uh, up with. You have to include all of. The FYI's the extra information. And I mean, here is, let's see. This is the C's. I've been past the C's. But this is the E's, the enzymes. And I was up to the L's. No. Because I have printed it out and I have it. But so in order to pick up where I left off. I just have to take a break because I'm 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 not happy about that. But before I let that energy go into a downward spiral of my feelings and emotions, I'll pick up on research strategies because um, I thought it would be a great idea to continue to follow in what I have for video number one. The first video was better than I thought when I didn't judge him, but I just thought the subject wasn't what I was looking for. It turns out not so much. It isn't um, you know, just as cut and dry as I thought it was going to be. So, um, the, it, he's entered 1-4 into the World Wide Web. It tends to level out authority. Google search can bring you the work of an expert in a field as well as a website produced by Ms. Jackson's third grade science class. Okay, so I I got as far as up to 1.5. And I remember clearly that I was saying, well, I'm going to have to finish the chapter. I'm going to have four pages left and exactly chapter two is taking charge and here we got one two three and four and so information today is one five I'll go ahead and go blow through that again Let's look at the status of some of the main sources of information today, which um, I don't know how, yeah, my earplugs are, is not affecting me, so um, we're already four minutes in, so let me hurry up. Let's look at the status. It's called Information Today, 1.5, 1, 1 The State of the Art. Let's look at the status of some of the main sources of information, books. Book publishing is continuing with no hint of a slowdown in the process. The big story in recent years has been the rise of the ebook. I read this part, so I'm not going. That's why I was looking at it and I was like, okay, five pages now. Um, let's start on 152. 15.2. Journals and magazines. Oh, I have. 
the ever loving dog ear. <laughs> if I take my time here, I'll be okay. All right, this open access journal movement is growing in opposition um, to the outrageous cost of scholarly journals. Many new journals are being published directly online after proper peer review and are available for free to anyone who wants to read them. In this, we have the best of the gatekeeping approach of traditional publishing and the free dissemination, dissemination of information provided by the internet. For searchable databases of open access journals, go to directory of open dash access journals, parentheses over 4,000 journals covered, HTTP, uh, www.doaj.org, OpenJGate, or Electronic Journals Library. And has another web page here that's it's really is reason res, uni uni regionsburg de dot I mean backslash e z e it backslash index and I don't know a bunch of A's and if you see it come up you should be able to know what you're looking for. But Cornell University has ARXIV.org, a collection of hundreds of thousands of papers in the sciences, computer science, and finance. Two highly touted public access, open access sites or academic resources or public library of science or PLOS or .org, which has created its own super journals and the similar Open Library of Humanities of OpenLIBHUMS.org still under development. There are, of course, fakes and charlatans out there who produce supposedly quote-unquote academic online journals that are anything but. Several scholars have published lists of such predatory enterprises to help you be aware of them. For example, scholarlyoa.com slash individual dash journals backslash period. The pay versus open access distinction may not mean much to you if you're a student in higher education because your institution provides journals as part of those incredibly high tuition fees you pay. Once you have graduated, however, and no longer have access to the same databases, open access journals may well be a lifeline. Unrestricted unavailability of journals will increase over the next couple of decades due to open access initiatives. The Compact for Open Access Publishing Equity, or COPE, represents a movement within universities to provide scholars with funds to publish on their journal articles within open access venues, thus taking funds from expensive journal subscriptions and using the money to support open access. I'm noticing as well that an increasing number of scholars are self-archiving their published articles, putting them up on their own websites. A good tool to find such self-archived materials, Google Scholar. Despite this growing trend towards open access available for free journals, the majority of journals and magazines are not accessible full text through a Google search. Using a search engine on the net generally gets you a different, a very different class of information that does, that does using a journal database through an academic library database. Library database. That is why using a search engine like Google or Bing for a large portion of your academic research will greatly limit your ability to do good work. 
while not quite in the category of journal articles, there is a growing interest in materials put into institutional repositories. Think of electronic filing cabinets full of all kinds of academic information from in-house studies to dissertations. A great tool for finding such stuff is Open DOAR, the Directory of Open Access Repositories, or .opendoar.org. Government and Corporate Documents. Governments and other corporate documents continue to publish vast amounts of information due to the convenience of the World Wide Web as a, as a vehicle. More and more government information is moving to an online environment where it is usually freely available for directories to such resources. Go to the International Government Information site at www lib.utexas.edu slash government slash world slash htm. The World Wide Web. We have already looked at advantages and challenges of the web. Ongoing issues include use of web for highly negative purpose, terrorism, child pornography, and etc. Quality challenges, which become evaluation skill problems, the need to catalog the more important websites in order to provide better searchability, a demand for search engines that are better able to identify the information we need most, and a requirement for increased instruction for users so that they can optimize the web experience. My coffee, I just warmed it up. Let me get a sip. Web 2.0. Web 2.0 is really a concept rather than a defined area of the internet. If you imagine an average web page to be a publication, a one-way communication from the author to the reader, Web 2.0 forms those parts of the World Wide Web that are interactive. We can include here social networking sites, blogs, wikis, online office tools like Google Docs, RSS feeds, forums, chat, messaging, email, and so on. As a concept, Web 2.0 doesn't mean too much unless we look at what it does for information. Take the wiki software that enables you to create web pages that others can edit. One scholarly use for a wiki is in collaborative research projects where several people contribute to an article or some other piece of writing. Another is embodied in Wikipedia and online Wikipedia that is shaped and revised by its users and its smaller but more upscale cousin, Citizendium. More recently, sites like Draft or Drafting in.com are bringing a level of sophistication to collaborative writing, enabling each partner to save his or her own drafts of work done together. Blogs offer opportunity for one person to post ideas and others to comment on those posts. Forums and chat enable two or more people to share information that can be revised as the discussion proceeds. Social networking websites like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter are enhancing opportunities for people to group think about information that is of interest to them. Web 2.0 assumes that connectivity and collaboration create better ideas and make a better world than did one-way communication. This, of course, is not a new insight. Those pre-literate people who recounted their history around the campfire so many centuries ago were doing the same thing, but without our technology. We need to be careful, however, not to put Web 2.0 about Web above Web 1.0.
and traditional publishing as if collaboration gives our information an edge or credibility that one-way publication could not do. Certainly, a meeting of minds can often result in something better, but that is only the case if the collaborators actually know what they're talking about in the first place. Truth to tell, much of what you find on Web 2.0 is simply the same old shallow thinking you find in a lot of person-to-person -person conversations. Information is no more valuable than the ability of its authors to know something about their subject and to think well. One thing a researcher must guard against is the assumption that because a number of people believe something, it is actually to believe, be believed. Shared opinion is not fact. To move to a level of certainty you can live with, you need to evaluate information by acceptable standards. Some people are now discussing Web 3.0, which is essentially artificial intelligence. The ability of our technology to learn our preferences and anticipate our needs, while not yet a reality in most situations. 3.0, also sometimes called the semantic web, will be a growing interest in the information world. 1.6. Primary and secondary information sources. Books and articles that come right from the context of a subject straight out of the horse's mouth, so to speak, are primary sources. Books or articles that comment on the work of pioneers in a subject are called secondary sources. Here are some examples. Primary, text of Homer's Iliad. Secondary, a modern scholarly study of Homer's Iliad. Primary, a scientific report written by the researcher. Secondary, someone else's analysis of the report. Primary, first-hand account of a witness of 911 street person's account of street life. Secondary, book on 911 by someone not there. Analysis of research about street people. Primary. Text of the Trials of Galileo, secondary, commentary on the Trials of Galileo. Your professor may well want you to consult primary sources on your topic. The key to figuring out what is primary and what is secondary is to ask whether it is an eyewitness account, comes from the subject's text time period, is written by a key scholar who developed the subject area is a direct report of an experiment done by an author of the report, and so on. If so, you have a primary source. It's right from the horse's mouth. If not, you likely have a secondary source. Secondary sources in general comment on, analyze, and explain the material you find in a primary source. Clearing the fog. What's all this talk about academic information? This is the first of a number of vin, vignettes, vignettes in this book that will answer specific issues in the research process. Each will come under the moniker of quote unquote clearing the fog. I hope you find them useful. When Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz discovered she was now in the land of Oz, she told her dog Toto, quote, We're not in Kansas anymore. If you've recently come into or, came or come back to higher education, one of the first things to recognize is that this isn't Kansas, this is academia. It has new rules, new players, new sources of information, and new ways of doing research. Some students decide that if Google and Wikipedia were good enough for Kansas, they're good enough for academia. But most soon discover that these tools just don't work very well for academic information. Why do I, why, why do I mean by 
academic in this sense. I could tell you that it's written by people with higher degrees, PhD, or that it's peer reviewed, check out by other scholars, checked out by other scholars in a field before it can be published, or that is or that it has to have notes and bibliographies. But let's get the inside story. A piece of information is academic if it is accepted as academic by those in the field like your professor. Each scholarly discipline has its favorite sources of information, favorite scholars, favorite rules for doing research, favorite rules of evidence, and so on. So your professor will tell you to make use of academic and or scholarly or peer-reviewed literature and anything else will probably give you problems. In this environment, Google and Wikipedia are far less helpful than the sophisticated academic search engines you'll be learning about in this book. Many of us see a piece of information as acceptable if it, quote, sounds right, end quote, or looks right, quote, unquote, or makes sense, quote, unquote. That's the essence of what we do with Google results, make many of which don't give us clear data to tell us whether or not they are academic. But in the land of academia, our gut feeling about information doesn't come near to helping us determine whether or not a professor will accept it. Many results are at a lay level, far below academic requirements. While academic library catalogs and database are not perfect, they are much more likely to make to take us to genuine academic information. So we need a change in mindset. Google and Wikipedia can be helpful, but they need to take third or fourth stage when we are in academia. They are better. There are better tools for academic information, tools that much more reliably get us the resources that a professor think are worthy. One seven warning: Not all information is informative. We live in a world of many words. The sheer number of words we encounter every day is far greater than it ever has been in all human history. Some of those words come together into information that we can use. Others come together into nonsense. Not all information is equal. As you enter the information fog, there are assigned posts that help you to discern genuine information from everything else that passes for the real thing. Ask yourself, bullet, what are the qualifications of the author of this information, usually your best measure of quality, bullet. Two, who else believes this, bullet three? Has this information been subjected to some kind of peer review or other form of gatekeeping? Bullet four. Are there vested interests at stake? For example, is that glowing description of the latest gadget actually authored by the company that wants to sell it to you and knows that you have money? Bullet five. What are some good reasons for not believing it? Get ready. We are about to enter the information fog. I hope you enjoy the journey. 1-8, which is the last section of chapter 1, and then I'm going to close after that for now. For further study. Study guide 1. How do traditional societies handle information? Two, how did the inventor of write, invention of writing change the pre-writing methods by which a society handled information? Three, name several significant changes to the world of information brought about by the printing press. Four, in the process of publishing information, what is gatekeeping and why is it significant? Five, 
In what ways is the creation of the World Wide Web a revolution for information? Number six, name some advantages of ebooks. Can you think of drawbacks? Seven, what is peer review in journal article publishing? Eight, what is the open access movement and why was it seen as necessary? Nine, where is the best place to find government documents? Ten, what are the advantages and limitations of Web 2.0 for information? And last but not least, in chapter one, and woohoo, 11, why is not all quote unquote information actually formative? And next is chapter two, which is taking charge. And we'll take charge at another time, later date than now. And peace out.